feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water, and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now. Nothing gonna bring me down. Hi, and welcome to the National University of Singapore Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine Healthy Longevity Webinar. Thanks for joining us. Uh, we have uh, Professor Shai on tonight who will be talking about uh, hyperbaric chambers and uh, the use in, in longevity. Uh, that'll be a really exciting discussion. I'm coming to you tonight from the U.S. We've been on the, on the cusp of several exciting longevity meetings, including the Longevity Summit Dublin, uh, earlier in August, and more recently, the Aging Research and Drug Development Conference in Copenhagen, which is really a fascinating conference. It's growing every year, and it was 800 live participants and about 5,000 people online. So if that gives you a little bit of the feel of the momentum of longevity research these days. Um, I'd like to remind you to use the Q&A function to ask questions, and we will try to get to your questions tonight. And we'll be coming to the main presentation shortly. Uh, but before that, we have Lim Kai Shuang, a research assistant in the Healthy Longevity Translational Research Program, talking about a systemic review on the effectiveness of lifestyle medicine on cognitive function in mild cognitive impairment and dementia. Thank you for the kind introductions. As mentioned, my name is Kai Shen. I'm going to share with you all a systematic review paper, which is regarding the effectiveness of lifestyle interventions on cognitive functions in mild cognitive impairments and dementia. First, let's have a short introduction about dementia and mild cognitive impairment. According to WHO, dementia affects 55 million people in worldwide. It is characterized by progressive deterioration in various cognitive domains and therefore have a high prevalence in older adults. Due to the severe cognitive decline, it leads to a loss of independent daily living abilities. Besides, some people were identified as having mild cognitive impairment, MCI, which is a transitional stage between normal connection and dementia. Study reported that the overall prevalence of MCI in clinic-based and community-based population is 21%, and the progression rate to dementia is 34%. Various lifestyle factors were found to be associated with the risk of dementia and MCI. For example, reviews indicated that a high intake of dietary saturated fatty acid was associated with higher risk of developing dementia or MCI. In contrast, daily consumption of vegetables and fruits, unsaturated fatty acids, and a Mediterranean diet were associated with a lower risk of dementia and MCI. Besides this, compared to a sedentary lifestyle, different levels of physical activity were associated with a significant reduction in risk of cognitive decline by 35 to 38% among non demanded people. A cohort study reported a higher level of psychological distress was associated with an increased risk of 20 to 30% in dementia. However, most reviews only examined the effect of a specific type of lifestyle interventions and leads to a lack of direct comparison of various components of lifestyle intervention in a comprehensive review. 
Therefore, the authors aim to examine and compare the therapeutic effects of various components of lifestyle medicines. The, re the results suggested that exercise significantly improved cognitive function in both dementia and MCI. In people with dementia, exercise shows more improvement only in global connections, executive functions, nonverbal memory, and working memory. The positive effect of exercise was also observed on people with MCI. Moderate improvement found in global connections, nonverbal memory, attention, executive functions, and working memory. It is also improved verbal learning and memory and processing speed, but to a lesser extent. For interventions addressing stress management or emotional well-being, existing evidence from MCI patients did not show a significant effect on cognitive functions. Studies on dementia were limited and reported mixed results. The effects of dietary interventions was not examined due to a lack of randomized control trials investigating the impact of changing dietary pattern in dementia and MCI. In conclusions, exercise interventions in lifestyle medicines can be a clinically useful method for protecting people with dementia and MCI against cognitive decline. Among different types of exercise, resistant training was recommended as the most effective exercise interventions. The authors also suggested that early exercise intervention at the stage of MCI may more effective than a later stage of dementia. Hence, it is never too late to get started. Let's go for exercise today. Here is the end of my presentations. Thank you for turning in. Thank you for the presentation. And I want to get right to the main event. Um, Professor Shai Afradi is at the School of Medicine at the Seigal School of Neuroscience in Tel Aviv University and director of the Seigal Center for Hyperbaric Medicine and Research. Um, at the Shamir Medical Center in Israel. The center has become the largest hyperbaric center worldwide, currently treating more than 350 patients per day. Uh, he received his PhD from Ben Gurion University in 2000 and completed his residency at Shamir Medical Center, specializing in internal medicine and nephrology. Uh, and since 2005, he serves as the head of research and development a unit at Shamir Medical Center, and since 2014, he's been the director of the nef nephrology department. His research focuses on the effect of hyperbaric oxygen therapy on physiology and a variety of different brain pathologies. And he's conducted a, a wide variety of research and also looked at preclinical studies on the mechanisms of hyperbaric oxygen therapy, uh, which include normalization of mitochondrial function, stem cell migration, and a whole range of other hallmarks of aging. Um, the topic of his talk today is going to be the regenerative effects of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. A lot of people ask me about this, um, so thanks for joining me and, and, and telling us the whole story. And thank you, Brian, for the, for the intro. I'm happy to be here with you. I always prefer that we are doing things in the same space, but in today's world, that's, that's how it is. So you are 4 a.m., I'm in the mid, and you are in Singapore in the late afternoon or evening. So I'm happy to be here. And I'm a physician, and as a physician, I'm trying to measure things and to evaluate things. And if we are speaking about longevity in general, longevity is something that it's hard to measure, at least in humans, because if I want to do a study and evaluate longevity, it's something that will take me time and I don't know if I have the time to finish it. So actually, actually what we are dealing with is, is performance. And performance is something that we can measure. And if we are speaking about performance, there is always a bottleneck to our performance. So when we are young, we have an amazing biology, the body is amazing, the biologic is amazing, the brain functionality is amazing. However, the bottleneck to our performance is, is the life experience and, and the knowledge that we have. 
a long life, we have more knowledge. We are becoming wiser. We have more life experience. And then the biology becomes the bottleneck. And if we want to improve the performance, all, all we need to do is to open open the biological bottleneck. That's that's what we need to do. And that's the goal of the approach that we are leading. Another thing with regard to performance, performance depends on the balance between regeneration to degeneration. Our ability to build up and repair and the things that takes us down, the damage. If I will take a car, the minute the car is out of the factory, degeneration starts. And from time to time, we need we need to take this car to, to the garage and, and to repair. With regard to humans, when we are speaking about regeneration, and that's what we need in order to change the balance, we can mark three major period of time biology period of time in our development. First, when we are young, when we are children, everything is growing up. The net effect is toward regeneration. The body, the brain, all, all the capacity that we have is growing up. The second period of life is the reproductive years. And during the reproductive years, this is the time where we are bringing the next generation into that world. We have regeneration less than what we have as children. And then the balance is, is stability. The next phase is, is what we call the post-reproductive period. During that period of time, the regenerative capacity is going down. The stem cells are going down. Our ability to build new blood vessels is going down. And the net effect is degeneration. And there is a line that that from this line on, we are dealing with what we call frailty, that we don't have any spare. So what happened? What happened during that those period, period of time? What are the bottlenecks? What, what, what are the main elements that we need to target if we want to improve our biological performance? The first thing is, is stem cells. You know, stem cells are cells that can differentiate into the different tissue or missing tissue in our body. At the first period of life during childhood, huge amount of stem cells, very potent. Reproductive, we have less and less potent. And in the post-reproductive period, the amount of stem cells that we have, the amount of the regenerative capacity that we have is going down dramatically. So this is, this is one bottleneck. The other bottleneck is related to the to the pipes, to the access, to the blood vessels that we have in our body. Like any pipe in the house, we have an occlusion process. We call it atherosclerosis. And then less blood flow, less oxygen is being delivered to whatever tissue that we have in our body. And this process starts early and becomes a limiting factor during the post-reproductive period. As for example, we can look at this brain. See, this is a young brain, healthy young brain of somebody of 25. And this is the normal, the so-called normal average brain of somebody who is above the age of 75. And we can see these white patches. And these white patches are actually scars that we have from occlusion of, of small blood vessels. Another thing which is crucial, which is the mitochondria. Mitochondria is, is the energy generator within the cell. And a long life, also the mitochondrial function is going down. Our ability to generate energy, to generate power, is, is declining a long age. So we need to repair. And, you know, when, when you are racing in Formula One, you have two choices when you need to go to the garage. You can crash and go to the garage, or before doing that, you can make a stop at the pit stop. And if you are a good racer, you will make the stop at the pit stop because you know that even though you're losing some time, still you will do better at the long term of the race. So let's say we will have a pit stop. What are the classical things that we will need for the pit stop of our body. We will need 
a trigger, a trigger that can stimulate the regenerative process. We spoke about stem cells that are going out, so we will need more than them. We need the energy because anything, any process that happen in our body and not in our, not only in our body is energy dependent. And for energy, we will need oxygen and we will have to improve the mitochondrial function. And the last thing that we will need to repair when we are stopping in the pit stop is angiogenesis. We need to generate new blood vessels that can bypass the occlusion that we have. So this is, this is the classical thing that we will need from human perspective for a classical pit stop. Let's start with the trigger. The most powerful trigger that we have in our body that induce regeneration is hypoxia, is lack of oxygen. When there is lack of oxygen, the body sense that there's going to be a problem, there must be a damage, and because of that, it activates a regenerative process, a regenerative cascade. The most powerful trigger is HIF. HIF stands for Hypoxic Induced Prop Factor. We have three Nobel Prize winner two years ago about discovery of the HIF. And when HIF is going up, a lot of genes start to express themselves. So you might say, okay, HIF, HIF is a trigger, hypoxia is a trigger, so I will take a person, hold his breath, stop his heartbeat, I will have hypoxia. There is only one problem with regard to that there will really be a damage and we will need the regenerative process. So we were thinking what the body actually sends. Does the body sense the absolute value of the oxygen or does the body sense the fluctuation? There is no absolute in anything. And we have come to find out after more than 10 years of research that we can trick the body. We can take the oxygen, increase it to a very high level, and then do a fast decline back to the normal. When we are doing a fast decline back to the normal from high, very high level, then that's being sensed at the cellular level as hypoxia, as lack of oxygen, even though we don't have any hypoxia. This is what we call the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. We are inducing all the things that happen during hypoxia in hyperoxygenized environment. In order to do that, and in order to enable us to play with the oxygen fluctuation to the level that we need, we need a chamber, and this is this is our hyperbaric chamber. People are going inside. We are compressing the chamber with air, not with oxygen. And once you are compressing the chamber, we can have more molecules of oxygen or whatever air that we are breathing per square. More is going to the lungs and from the lungs to the blood vessels and all of our body. So the people are sitting inside. We put them in two atmosphere. They take the oxygen by mass. We are increasing the blood oxygenation from 100 mercuries to 1500 mercuries. And then all we do and that's the big trick. We ask them to take the mask off every 20 minutes. By taking the mask off, the oxygen is declining from very high back to the normal. And that's trigger the regenerative cascade. HIF is going up. This is an example of what happened at the cellular level. We can see that if we are exposing to that level of high oxygen, you can see that the HIF is going to zero, but when we are going back to the same level of oxygen that we had before, we can see that HIF is increasing, meaning at the cellular level, it's being sensed as hypoxia. We can see that happen in human clinical study. This is baseline, and this is repeated treatment with the hyperbaric oxygen therapy that we do with the protocol that we use. And that's how we trigger. And once we have that trigger, that trigger also being sensed by the stem cells. The stem cells are dormant cell with metabolism that is very, very low, almost zero, a metabolism that enables the cells to stay alive, but they don't utilize energy. But when we have the trigger of the hypoxia, of the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox, 
they say, oh my God, there is a problem we need to replicate. And here you can see people that are coming for repeated sessions based on our protocol of fluctuation in the oxygen pressure and concentration. And you can see how the stem cells are going down up from one session to the other. Having stem cells up, it's nice, but it's not good enough. Because if, for example, I will take this plant and put it in that land, the desert land on the left side, probably nothing will happen. However, if I will put this plant in this flourish land, it will grow, proliferate, and we will have an amazing environment. What is happening in our body, especially a long aging, is that we have occlusion of small blood vessels. On the left side, you can see a potent blood vessels, but on the right side, you can see the occlusion, and whatever comes after this occlusion suffer from hypoxia. So this is actually a desert. It doesn't matter what stem cells I will implant in that area, it doesn't have the land that enabling to grow and flourish. However, if I'm taking this and put this environment in the hyperoxygenized environment in the chamber in two ATA, you can see that the amount of the dissolved oxygen that we have is sufficient for all the energy demand of the body. So oxygen can be delivered even into this desert land. And now we have what we need in order to enable them to flourish and grow. We need to overcome this problem because people cannot live in the in the chamber. So in order to do that, we need generation of new blood vessels that will bypass this bottleneck of occlusion. And that's what we call angiogenesis. Can we do that? Yes, yes, we can. What do we need for angiogenesis? We need the trigger, which is the fluctuation that we generate. We need the stem cells that can differentiate into the blood vessels, and we have it because of the stimuli, and we need the energy. And then we can demonstrate, this is our aging mice, we can demonstrate generation of new blood vessels in the brain, something that we thought in the past that is, is impossible to generate new blood vessels in the brain. The last thing that we want to tackle in the pit stop, we spoke about the mitochondria. Uh, so the mitochondria, as said before, is the organelle in the cell that generates the energy. And what the mitochondria is actually feeling is the free oxygen that we have. If we speak about the blood vessels that we have in normal condition, 100 mercury in oxygen, at the mitochondria level, it's between one to four. Depends how far the mitochondria is from the capillary. And what we are doing with the fluctuation that we generate with the oxygen is just like we are doing interval training to the mitochondria. And then we can see that by doing this protocol, we can actually make the mitochondria to proliferate. So we have more mitochondria. Here you can see it in the muscle. And here you can see it in the brain, in the hippocampus. And we can have more mitochondria and more activity per mitochondria. In animal models, we have it all over in different models, different organs. We have challenges in human beings and we can, today with the technology that we have, we can actually do muscle biopsy, take the muscle cells out and evaluate the mitochondria at the muscle level. And then we can see clearly in humans that we can have more activity of mitochondria, complex one of mitochondria, meaning the efficiency of generating energy is better. But we can see also that we have mitochondrial proliferation. So we have more mitochondria. Uh, in humans, we are not taking the brain out, so we can do the basal biopsy only, only, only. So what is the standard clinical practice used today with the hyperbaric or general medicine? It's not only the hyperbaric. In general medicine, we are not making a stop at the pit stop. We are usually taking the car to the garage when it's when it's crash. Now I assume that the people that that hear now this this webinar are not waiting for the crash. They are waiting. They want to improve their function. They want to make the stop at the pit stop. 
So with regard to the crash in hyperbaric, we can regenerate wounds, peripheral wounds. We have studies we have done on post-rock patient. This is an example, and we can see how we can regenerate damaged tissue that is not fully dead on stroke patient. But with this regards, when we are speaking about longevity, we don't want to wait for the crash. We want to make the pit stop. And with regard to that, we have done one of the most, most comprehensive studies done till now on what we call normal aging. And in that clinical study, we took not patient, we took healthy individual, normal for their age, at the age of 65 or older, non-obese, non-smoker, non-diabetic, no stroke, no cardiac problem, fully healthy, fully active, us. And what we did, we randomized them into two group. One received our protocol, the other was served as a control group. And then we can see, this is with regard to the cognitive function, and we are using computerized testing. We can see that the global cognitive score is improving, memory is improving, attention, information processing speed. And that's happened because we can see for the first time, we can see the neuroplasticity, the generation of new blood vessels and new neurons in the brain. So if you want an example for that, this is the kind of imaging that we do. We are doing perfusion MRI, with ETI and perfusion mean perfusion in the small blood vessels. And here you can see an example of one of the patients. Uh, we can see the baseline. We can see that if we are looking at the hippocampus, this is what you see here in, in circle. You can see before treatment, you can see after treatment, and that's the way I like it. We can see, visualize that, and we can see the change. We can also use the DTI in order to track the nerve fibers, and you can see over here that indeed neurogenesis in the brain is feasible, and we can see it. We can see it in mice and rats model when we are doing the biopsy. However, in humans, we need to do it with the MRI DTI. This process happens in the brain, but as you can understand, when we are doing this hyperoxic epoxic paradox, it's been utilized all over. So for this population, we have done also cardiac MRI, and you can see that the perfusion is going down a long age. And then for the first time, we can see angiogenesis in the heart. This is not anti-aging. This is actually what I call reverse aging. This is taking the biology back in time. When the cardiac function is improving, the cardiopulmonary function test is better with 50% improvement in the anaerobic threshold, the VO2 max, the power that we can generate. Another important organ that we also tested, which is, this is, this is our sexual function, the men's sexual function, which is easily to follow. One of the reasons for erectal problem, the most common one is, is occlusion of blood vessels, small blood vessels. The same that happen in the heart, in the brain, happens also in the penis. So this is a cardiac MRI. You can see no blood flow. Viagra doesn't work on the left side. And on the right side, you can see clearly the generation of the blue blood vessels and the erectile function is improving. This is just for correlation. You can see on the left side, upper row, the cerebral blood flow, the blood flow in the brain before and after treatment. And this is on the right side, probably the, the biggest brain. You can see the before, you can see the before and after. So when we are speaking about aging from our perspective or functionality from our perspective, we can speak about physiological function, physiological aging, the way the different organs in our body are functioning. And we just reviewed that. But we can also speak about the genomic aging. And when we are speaking about genomic aging, we know we speak about telomere, we speak about senescent cell, and I think the audience on this, on this webinar know exactly what it is. So for the first time in humans, using our fluctuation protocol, we can see elongation of telomeres. We can see it in, in a variety of cells, which means this is a systemic effect. And along with the elongation of the telomere, we can see on average 25% in the senescent cell. Mm -hmm. And as you all know, the senescent cell are the 
cells that don't replicate, don't go through apoptosis, they accumulate mutation, they may become cancer cell and they may cause many of the damage related to what we call the big sack of aging disease. With regard to evaluating what happened at the tissue, again, we are using the skin because this is the accessible tissue for us in humans. And we can see that the senescent cell in the skin, while we are doing also skin biopsy, is declining significantly. Together with that, we can see the angiogenesis when we are doing the skin biopsy. We can see the elastic fiber, and we can see the increase in the collagen also in the skin. Again, it's a systemic effect that doesn't happen at specific tissue. So, you know, people on this webinar look at the future and ask themselves where they want to be. And when people ask me where, where the world is going, I'm saying to them, it's a terrifying future. And they ask me why. Because what we have today, we have the science, we have the data that may improve our functionality and make us function better biologically. And if you function better biologically and you have the life experience that you gather a long life together with a better biology, this is, this is a species. This is a new species. However, most world is over here. What you see here on the right side, this is Dr. Joe Maroon. He's a neurosurgeon. When we started to work at the brain a couple of years ago, he looks at our world, he said, the work that we are doing he was interested, but not interested enough. And what happened with Joe Maroon after he reviewed all of our new study, he decided that he wants to take the treatment for himself. So we have affiliated centers, in, in U, the U.S., for example, in Florida. So we have, he came to that, to that center that we have in Florida. He took the treatment from himself. And after getting the treatment protocol, he has improved his triathlon score by half an hour, which is, which is amazing. He's 82 years old. He's fully active. Life experience is amazing. The knowledge that he has is amazing. And think about his biology. He just improved his triathlon score by half an hour. Think about the amazing potency and performance that this, this person has. He's an amazing human being by itself, amazingly smart. On the other hand, look on the left side on this species. It's a totally different species. And the world is dividing. Now, Dr. Joe Maroon is taking advantage of his biology and his performance in order to bring new knowledge to medicine. Other person can take it to business. Other person can take it to politics or whatever it is. But that's an amazing world. And I'm sure that everybody on this webinar wants to be on the right side on the screen and not, and not on the left side on the screen. So... The last thing before I will finish and we will have time for Q&A, I want to emphasize that what you see on the left side, this is the real hyperbaric oxygen treatment. This is how you can generate the hyperoxic epoxic paradox. This is actually what works. However, on the right side, what you see, this is unfortunately across the world, there's a lot of there's a lot of unprofessional frogs, bullshit stuff. People are going into YouTube, inflate it with the, with the air, or there is a compressor that puts something inside that is uncontrolled, without quality assurance, not the protocol, totally not what we investigated and proved to be effective. People should be aware of that. Never, ever dare to go into that tubes. I always tell people that your health is the most important thing that you have. Don't put it under risk. If you need to get the treatment, do it in professional place, with professional physicians, with the professional equipment that have the quality assurance and everything that is needed in order to take you safe and effective during the journey. So on the right side, it's quite 
it's frog, it's bullshit, and people should be aware of that and be careful from it. So I think I, w- I will make a stop over here uh, since it's, that's, that's my time and we have time now for questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot. That was a very interesting talk, and it, it certainly raises a lot of different questions. Uh, uh, so I think there's some fascinating data to talk about. Uh, maybe first, I just wanted to start with a comment that you made that you're really looking at performance and not longevity in humans. And actually, you know, this is something that I've been talking about recently. I think that there's much less difference between those two things than than people might have assumed in the past. That you know, if you look at the interventions that we recommend people do for longevity and those that we recommend that people do for performance, they're probably 90% overlapping anyway. And, you know, there, I, I think there, what that probably suggests is there's a strong correlation between, you know, performing now and staying healthy in the long term, as long as you keep, you know, those strategies. So, you know, it, it, it's interesting that that we can think about it that way. I, I did want to ask a question that I think are like uh, a lot of, a lot of people's minds though, which is, you know, there are now biomarkers of aging, which people believe at different levels. They're not fully validated yet, but they can be done. Uh, has, has anybody looked at uh, say methylation clocks or things like that and people undergoing uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy? This, you spoke about biological clock, uh, we are evaluating now different biological clock, but before evaluating effect on biological clock, I must tell you, and you know it probably better than me, we don't know exactly what clock we should use. Because yeah. many clocks, if you will take it today and you will take it the other day, you will find a different that doesn't mean necessarily a significant change in the biology. So we are evaluating test, retest, stability of different things now at the moment. Hopefully we will have something stable that we can stand behind. Uh, So what we did those far, we did proteomics and people can read about it. We can, we did a telomer, which is, we know the test retest, which is quite stable in the method that we use today. And we did a senescent cell, which is also quite stable. Regarding the rest, including methylation, at least in our hand, it's not doesn't correlate good enough. So once we will have something that is correlated with a good test retest that I think as a physician actually reflect the human biology, we will use it and report about it. Yeah, you brought up telomeres. Do you know the mechanism for elongating telomeres? Is telomerase being reactivated or are there other it, strategies that are being employed? It's, I must tell you that it's not fully clear to me. And the reason we went into evaluating telomeres, you, I think you probably recognize the twin experiments that NASA have done. If you're familiar with that, you know, they have sent one, one twin to the outer space to be, to be there for a while. And the other identical twins were staying on Earth. And one of the things that they saw is that when they brought back the twin from the outer space, they evaluate again, everything on them. And one of the things that we're changing was the telomere. Now, it was, I think it was a couple of years ago. And when I saw the results of these experiments, I have gathered all my research team and I said to them, this is great. Now we can work on the telomere. And all the guys looked at me as, again, as a crazy guy, shy, what that's related? This is outer space. This is here. And I said, no, 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 no. It means that if we are changing pressure, and environmental air, we can actually affect the telomere at the cellular level. From this point on, it's only, you know, calibrating what kind of pressure, when you're going up, when you're going down. Now, as you're well familiar, now it seems a big success, but it's 18 years of research and starting to calibrate and doing and find the optimal protocol in order to achieve that. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, you you mentioned also while we're coming back to longevity for a sec, you mentioned also rats studies. Uh, You can do longevity studies in rats. Has anybody looked at lifespan uh, in rats or mice? We have pilot results with regard to aging rats. Okay. Uh, But again, you know, rats and mice are quite different than human beings. For example, look at what they eat. Okay. 
they doesn't eat meat with the oil and all the things that we eat. The atherosclerosis process in mice and rats are not as we eat. So actually the bottlenecks in mice and rats are different. And, and one of the reason, in my perspective at least, is that even though we have an amazing result with many intervention in mice and rats, in human beings, we are not achieving the same, even though in mice and rats, they are okay. Because, you know, in any process, there is a bottleneck. And unless you open in one bottleneck, you will not reach the second one. And in humans, mostly with aging, one of the most common bottleneck that we have is the atherosclerosis and the ischemia. That trigger inflammation, that trigger. So if you will not open that, you cannot reach the second bottleneck. If you are going to the supermarket, the supermarket can be big, huge, but if you want, you have one cashier, then that's the right limiting factor. Okay, so rats and mice model are good. We have model of rats with the Alzheimer's disease that we can demonstrate that we can generate blood vessels over there, reduce the amyloid plaque, improve the cognitive function. We are doing that, okay? And people can read those articles. However, we have to be very cautious when we are going from mice, from rats to human beings. They are not mammals even, okay? So, but we can learn about the biology. We can see that actually what we see in humans actually happen at the, at the tissue level. You know, having said that, there is a de- evidence that activating HIF one alpha can extend lifespan in some simple invertebrates. And you know, I think the mouse studies have been hard to do, but the you know, it's um there there probably is some correlation between what you're doing and longevity in some of the animal models. Indeed, you're absolutely right. Um, so I wanted to raise a this is kind of a straw man, but people that watch this show uh um think a lot about aging pathways. And one of the things that they think about a lot is reactive oxygen species. So the first reaction people might have to this kind of a treatment is you're flooding the body with oxygen uh, and you're going to drive increased reactive oxygen damage. Have you looked at that? And do you, uh, do yeah. you, and do I, you I, see any I changes? Must... Yeah. So first of all, this is an excellent question because today we are using ROS or reactive oxygen species as a buzzword. So we need to clarify what does it mean, okay? So actually, what does it mean is that when the mitochondria is generating ATP, which is unit of energy, during that process, there is electron that is being transferred from one complex of the mitochondria to the other. Along that way, the electron may skip out. And once it's skipping out, it's unstable and is looking for place to settle down. This is what we call ROS, okay? What does it mean? If I'm activating the mitochondria more, I will have more ROS. For example, when I'm doing exercise, I'm increasing the ROS significantly. Is ROS a problem? Is exercise a problem? Of course not. This is the best thing that we have today. So at least until now, any intervention that gives the so-called antioxidant, which is has nothing to do with oxygen, okay, that gives any kind of commercial antioxidant have negative results, even the, the opposite, okay? The results, the clinical results are worse if you are taking antioxidant. It's a big industry that doing a lot in order to market, but it has nothing to do with that. Now, if you will take cell in the lab and you will put a lot of ROS on it, they will function less. But even if we will put a lot of sodium on it, even if we will put a lot of potassium on it, whatever take the homeostasis out will make it. So ROS is not a problem. The most common trigger for ROS generation is actually hypoxia, is lack of oxygen, because the mitochondria is malfunctioning and then you have ROS. Generally speaking, with our protocol, the amount of scavenger is going up, the mitochondria is functioning better, so you have less electron being released, so the ROS is going down. But this is this is this is has nothing to do with good and bad. It's nothing. Okay, and people who really understand the biology understand that you are dealing with something that is meaningless. 
However, there's still a lot of industry that say antioxidant ROS, it has nothing to do with oxygen. Hypoxia is the number one trigger for ROS generation, okay? Antioxidants, so-called, are doing nothing to your health. They are doing the opposite, okay? I think In I touched a nerve here. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's a good question. And the audience who, who takes antioxidant, you know, that's that's not the treatment. That's not the problem. I'm going to ask Joe to add a, about four or five minutes if we can spare a little bit more time because we have a lot of audience questions and I want to <laughs> pursue one more thread before I get to them. Uh, and this is a more practical one. Uh, so you mentioned a lot of the benefits of people uh, doing these um, this treatment and also uh, people that are, you did a study on relatively healthy older people. Um, how many treatments do they have to go through before you see these benefits? And um, are you measuring it shortly after the treatment or, you know, a, okay. a longer duration after the treatment? What's the durability of the effect? So, first of all, you know, our, our most interesting organ, at least here in my room, is the brain, okay? Is what we have here between the ears. So anyway, it's not a magic. It takes time. So once you are doing the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox from one session to the other, the amount of stem cells is going up, blood vessels start to regenerate. It's like wound repair. It takes time. And in the brain, it takes more time. So if you are coming, you are coming to a treatment protocol that includes 60 sessions, six zero daily session. Each session, it's two hours when you're sitting in the suite. That's what we call the chamber. And during that session, you have to take the mask on and off based on a protocol that we investigated. When we are doing the revaluation, we are doing it more than 10 days after the last session because we want to see the new steady state. We are not doing it immediately once you're out. So we wait more than 10 days, reevaluate, And then we are inviting people to, to follow-ups because we want to see that actually what's going on persists. So of course, when people are finishing the protocol, they're sitting in front of me, they're sitting, they're terrified. They're saying, you know, Shai, my brain is better, my sexual function is better, I run better, but, but what will happen now? Okay, my God, what will happen now? And I always tell them, relax. Now you're aging again, but don't worry. You are starting that from a higher level. The rate of decline is not is not faster. It's the same. Depends on your DNA. Depends on your habits and everything that you do. Usually, for people who are adherent to our program, usually the results can stand for two years. But of course, this is very individual. And every six months, we are doing reevaluation on cognitive function and physical performance, monitoring, seeing. And I think that one of the most important thing of what we call longevity, and you correctly say performance, because actually performance is something that we can measure. Longevity is something that we cannot measure per individual. I will give an example. If I want to treat somebody blood pressure, I must, I must measure it, okay? Otherwise, I'm, I'm in the dark. I don't know what I'm doing. So once you can measure that, you can treat that. So once you can measure the aging, you can measure the brain cognitively, you can measure the physical function, cardiac, cardiopulmonary exercise test, you can measure telomere, you can measure senescence. You have a measurement so you can optimize the protocol per individual and keep him for the long term by continuous monitoring. So let me bring in uh, Ming Lim here because there are a lot of questions from the audience. So I don't want to take all the time. So. Hello, Prof. Shai. Uh, there are a lot of questions here. I would say the first one would be, you mentioned about the trigger. So is it possible we trigger it with hypoxia mimicking drugs? That, uh, it pre uh, able to you know, increase the HIF-1 alpha level, by such as uh, rosazustan and Repodustella? We can yeah, use the so, drugs. Yeah, so as I said before, you can trigger by hypoxia in general. But the main problem when you are doing hypoxia is you are actually causing damage to the tissue, especially if we are speaking about aging population. And when I'm saying aging is about the age of 45, okay? So the bottleneck is not only triggering the HIF. 
you have also to tackle the other stuff. You have also to improve the length. As I said before, increasing stem cell is nice, but if you have, if you are in the desert, if the land is dirty, if the if the tissue is epoxic, nothing will grow. So you have to tackle all elements in order to induce significant regeneration. Otherwise, you have another bottleneck that you need to open. So you have to tackle it all. Mm, so far, is there any non adverse effects of the hyperbaric oxygen treatment? Okay. So there can be side effects, uh, and any individual who is considering the treatment should be evaluated by physician. There are even some contraindication to the treatment. For example, certain problem in the ears may be contraindicated. People who have epilepsy, epilepsy, okay, a locus in the brain when you have hyperactivity. So during the treatment, we are activating the neurons. We may activate that. There are certain lung pathology that are incompatible with the pressure. Okay, so this is not a joke. I highly advise anybody who considering the treatment, he should take it by professional who will evaluate and guide him through the treatment. Don't ever go into any sack full of air or any tube or anything like that. Don't jeopardize, jeopardize your health, okay? So they are, and each individual should be evaluated by professional in order to optimize the protocol and see that he is suitable for the treatment. I see. So usually for a patient, how long would they need to receive this treatment to get a effect that they really want to see? Like for example, better performance, for example, that you mentioned they increased 15% in their aerobic exercise. Yeah. Uh, usually, how long will it takes to show that? So, the, the standard protocol that we advise includes 60 sessions, six zero, three months, five days per week, okay? Two hours each session. So, people who are coming to our centers that can be in Israel, in the US, in Dubai, this is the operating system that we have now. Uh, we call them the Aviv Clinic. Uh, they need to come for three months. And when we have these stem cells up, we can take advantage over these stem cells in order to, to enhance also other capacities that usually doesn't happen when you are bypassing a certain age. So a lot of people, if I can just interject there, are going to think when you say that, that that's great, but I don't have three months. You know, they're busy. They So can, or can, you get, can you get benefits from incremental treatments or do you really need the whole, the whole so, course? I, I will start with the statement, I have no time. If you will come to our center here, you will see the most occupied people around the planet are making the free months coming to Israel or coming to other centers because they understand that the brain is the most, and their functionality is the most important thing for them. You will have the biggest CEOs that you can think of. You will come, you will see them, you will see them here. Why? Because they understand that they need to make a stop at the pit stop. They don't want to crush, okay? And and that's the highly performance. And I always say you should manage your health instead of managing a disease, okay? That's that's a crucial element, especially for the audience who are, who are listening to us, okay? When somebody suddenly have a stroke, have cardiac function, have a significant cognitive decline, suddenly he has all the time on the wall, okay? Now, even at the racing field, you know, the, the car racer can do another round, can do two more rounds, but he decided that now he's going to the pit stop. He's not taking the chance in taking another round and have the risk of a crash. So time, time is prioritizing. Prioritize your health. Manage your health. And even if you are not taking the treatment, start by monitoring. You know, we are doing exercise, take, taking blood samples, but when was the last time people evaluate their cognitive function, their brain functionality in high resolution MRI with functional with DTI and all of that? So prioritize your health and in the health, prioritize the things that we have here between the ears. And my, my way of thinking, make a stop at the pit stop and don't wait for the crash and then go to the garage. Since you had mentioned about the cognitive, um, there are questions regarding besides the MRI, 
that you have shown in your slide that they change just in their memory, their attentions. May I know what test you are doing? We have a full computerized testing that include NeuroTrack, ScanTab. It's a full computerized battery that can evaluate each cognitive domain objectively. And then we have a score per, per domain. So it's ScanTab. Okay. One of them is ScanTab, one of them is NeuroTrack. It's a whole battery. It's a whole battery. Okay. So there's, there's a more technical question here regarding the telomere. Would you please let us know how do you measure the telomere before and after the HBO treatment? And what is the procedure that you go through by DNA sequencing or karyotyping? So, first of all, what are telomeres? Okay. <laughs> telomeres, telomeres are, we have the DNA. Okay. The DNA is well protected within the nucleus. And during the replication, the bean, DNA is being split and matched. Okay. So, during the splitting and matching, the DNA is exposed. So in order to protect the DNA, whoever created us have put bumpers at the tip of the DNA so they can protect the DNA and take the heat on the extent of the DNA. And every time there is a split and match, then the DNA is going, is going down. Okay. So the, D, the telomeres are certain certain sequence of the DNA that, that repeat itself, and you can measure this sequence and how much repetition that you have. And based on this, you, you can determine the, the telomere length objectively. I believe that this treatment has yet to come into Singapore, right? So there are people who ask, since we cannot get this treatment here, is there any way we can you know, do some other stimulation in our own lifestyle to get benefits like this treatment? You know, that the topic of this webinar is the hyperoxic hypoxic paradox. If we will have another topic, I can speak about something else. But this is the topic of what we are currently focusing on. So, so I will keep the time for that. Okay. Um, so there's a person asked that, uh, did you measure the glutathione levels in your models with the O2 fluctuations? Do we measure what? I didn't understand. Glutathione. Glutathione levels. Glutathione. Mm. We are not measuring glutathione. A glutathione, it's a supplement that you take from the outside. You can measure the scavenger capacity in general. Okay? So the scavenger capacity is increasing. If you will have depletion of glutathione of what you eat, then that you will have depletion. If you have eat more, you will have more than that. So the glutathione level is not changing with this intervention. However, the scavenger efficiency is changing, if that's what he means. I also saw some questions regarding, is it possible if they use a, a mal, um, like the pressure is not as high as HBO, HBO but they increase the time duration, would they bring the similar effects? Again, again, I didn't understand the question. So let, me, let me try to paraphrase. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you use lower pressure at a longer time of treatment and get the same effects? Or um, if you so alter the, the answer, protocol, does it? Yeah. So the answer is very simple. The answer is no. Okay. We evaluated a lot of stuff in, in order to get to this exact protocol in order to achieve this biological effect. So anything that is not exactly what we investigated will not have the efficacy. Yeah. I know that I know that there's a lot of claims all over and people call again, this is the sack full of air, the tubes. This is not it. It has to be exactly what we investigated. We gave it 20 years in order to optimize it. Don't change it. You yeah. mentioned the danger of those tubes. Is it is there a higher chance of adverse events because of the poor control of pressure and oxygen in those tubes or what what is the risk of the tubes i will give you i will give you an example uh, the compressor that compress air into the tube you have no clue what is compressing not when you get it at home not what you get the week after now this is a compressor it might be possible that the co level there is high the co2 level there is high so you're actually bringing toxic thing into your body 
you don't want to play with that. Okay, so so you don't know what you're doing. So it's not effective because you cannot generate the fluctuation. You're not reaching the pressure that is needed in order to get it. And you are risking your health, but something that you don't have any quality assurance on what's going on inside. So don't use it. I know that people are, there are different factories that use my name and saying we are giving a fatty and this is what the fatty and using our study. But this is not it. You want to do something, do it right, get it by professional, by medical certified team, medical certified equipment. That's the way to do it. Has anyone that go through this treatment but didn't really sh- see any improvement? And if there is, what is the possible reasons? Maybe I can mm-hmm. add to that question really quickly. Um, you know, because one of the things we're noticing with other longevity interventions is different people respond to different interventions. So uh, you mentioned those two groups on the survival curve. One is trying to optimize their performance and the other are the couch potatoes, for lack of a better term. Which group is going to respond to this do you, uh, or, or will both respond? So first of all, the net effect of our performance is the balance between regeneration to degeneration. So if, so for example, you will take somebody who is overweight, smoke all day, okay? So it is going down. So it might be possible that you will slow the decline by adding something, but, but the first thing that he needs to do that will bring him most benefit is to quit smoking and change his habit. Okay, that's that's the f- first thing. On top of this, you can add something that brings regeneration, and then you will see the, the reverse process. So, for example, if somebody is sitting in front of me and he's smoking, I tell him, you have to quit smoking. He said, no, I cannot quit smoking. I said, okay, so I'm not treating you. Okay, you have to choose side, and that's the exact the example that I saw. It's either you saying, I don't care, I will go down, or either you say, I want to go up, okay? My choose is towards regeneration. So there are things that we cannot change yet in humans, which is the DNA. We can do it in animals, but the DNA is what we have. And if you had the car accident, unfortunately, and there is a damage from the outside. But there are things that are in our hand. When somebody smokes a cigarette, it's in your hand. Whatever you put in your mouth, it's in your hand. So so you have you have to choose whether you want to be like, Dr. Joe Maroon on the right side or whether you are a couch potato that smoke and don't give a damn and, and that's what you are. So the hyperbaric can give you an added value to regeneration. What's the meaning of that? Depends on, on the surrounding. Uh, I think we're going to have to stop there. We may have to have you back at some point because there's a million questions. Thanks, Ajiming. And sorry, I said your name wrong earlier. It's really early in the morning for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, uh, thanks, Professor, for joining us. It was really a great uh, discussion. And uh, uh, like I said, there are a lot of questions we couldn't get to, which shows you how interested people are. So with that, um, I want to uh, remind people to use the chat function and uh, the panelists and all attendees options to leave comments and feedback on the show. Uh, as we've said in the last few episodes, we're excited to announce our Unlock Healthy Longevity Supplements Conference February 29th and March 1st of next year. This will be the first global scientific conference focused solely on the role of supplements as a geroprotective intervention. And it brings together people from uh, interest all over the spectrum to discuss uh, what the best approaches are. Uh, Please check our website regularly because we're adding great international speakers all the time. Uh, Also, spread the word and save the date, uh, October 5th because that will be our 100th episode of this webinar. Uh, and I can't believe we're already at 100. Uh, my goal is to you know, pass all the Se- uh, Seinfeld episodes. So we're well on our way to doing that. Uh, so that'll be on October 5th. The Center for Healthy Longevity is also looking for a postdoc position in geroscience, uh, nutrition, and supplements to optimize health in middle-aged individuals and join our dynamic team. So please share this news with your network. We're looking for people now. 
Our next episode will be September 14th, and our speaker will be Professor Stuart Cook uh, from Duke in U.S. and also Imperial College London. Uh, and he'll be talking about interleukin-11 as a therapeutic target for mammalian health span. Uh, and I'll be joining you for that show as well. I want to leave you with a video, uh, 57 Years Apart, A Boy and a Man Talk About Life. And thanks for joining us. Right. Uh, what is the worst thing about being young? Well, you get lots of homework. It's also pretty, f it's, they're like in the, in the middle, like in, mm. in, in school, like in the middle of bad and good. Oh. What is the worst thing about being old? Not being able to do things that you could do when you were young. Um, like, uh, you can't bend down and get stuff on the floor. Well, I can still do that. But the problem is your body gets a bit stiff. No, I know it hurts a lot when you're trying yeah. to get down when you like are That's old. right, yes. You might get sick more often. Do you wish you were young? Uh, well, the problem about, uh, the great thing about being young is you have more time. You have more time to do things. I could play games, which I did. I used to play cowboys and Indians. Yeah, that's what I play. Do you? Yeah. That's what I like about being young. I could use my imagination more. Will you fall in love? And what will it be like? I don't know. Like, we'll have babies, it'll be like fun, I'll have had to change. Mm. Even though I'll have to change his diaper, it'll be fun. Ah. You don't have to be rich to be happy. Do the things you like doing that make you feel good. Because when you're happy yourself, everybody else is happy. Hey Sean, do you have advice for, for Des? To like, act normal. Don't be silly, don't bully lots of people. The people I know in school, like my friend Alex in school, whenever he gets hurt, I hug him. I might not be able to work, but... Oh, that's a good advice. Uh, and be yourself. Don't let other people tell you what you should be. Just be as you are, isn't that true? Yeah. And I'm sure your life is gonna be very successful. Yeah. You, you have all the right things. You have all the right things to do, all your good friends, and uh, keep those friends going, and keep life going. Oops, there you go. I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down